let me ask you a question. How good are you at recognizing uh, bird calls and uh, songs? I don't have a very good audio memory. And then in the summer, I kind of get used to some of the migratory birds and then they disappear. And when they come back, I can't really remember all of them or some of them. So this year I actually rediscovered Merlin's sound ID and I am absolutely addicted. I can't go anywhere without turning it on when I'm outside. I actually got some of my colleagues hooked on it completely. So let me explain how it works. Basically, you open the app and you just let it record. You can stand or you can walk around and it picks up all the bird calls and their songs and you can actually see which bird is singing or talking at that very moment. You don't have to worry about any other noises around. You know, I have kids with me all the time and they're pretty loud. So try it out. I'm sure you will love it as well. I know that some of you are still concerned about avian flu and bird feeders. Warren was receiving uh, mixed messages from different sources. So he actually reached out to Dr. Bird and asked him, what is he supposed to do? Hi, Warren. Probably one of the most vexing challenges faced by those of us is to whether to take one's feeders down when faced with a possible presence of a bird killing disease. The latest one has to do with avian flu, one of the more dangerous diseases threatening our birds. This nasty pathogen has now shown up in North America and confirmed cases of wild birds being affected by it are certainly out there. Does that mean we must take down our feeders as recommended by organizations concerned about animal welfare? First of all, avian flu usually affects poultry flocks. Because these domestic birds do occasionally come into contact with waterfowl, like ducks and geese, which in turn are preyed upon by raptorial birds like bald eagles and peregrine falcons, avian flu can certainly enter wild bird populations. But the odds of this disease affecting those songbirds visiting our feeders is exceedingly unlikely. And that is exactly why the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, the American Bird Conservancy and Birds Canada are not recommending that we take down our feeders. This is completely contrary to what your local SPCA is telling us to do. But I would rather listen to advice given by organizations who actually have bird experts on their staff rather than an organization which deal mainly with dogs and cats. Moreover, I would also ask why the SPCA is not also recommending to the public that we keep our cats indoors to help stop two billion birds from being killed every year and that we take steps to minimize bird collisions with windows. Why is avian flu so much more important than that? Well, it sounded like a good idea when I first got wind of it. I'm referring to the recent viral news item describing a commercial company's efforts to train birds to pick up cigarette butts off the streets of Swedish cities. The company, called Corvid Cleaning, is hoping to train highly intelligent hooded crows through the use of a machine that deposits a food reward, such as peanuts, for every cigarette butt dropped in. The company claims it could cut 75% of the city's cleaning costs related to cigarette butts. According to the founder of the project, Christian Gunther Hansen, the birds are doing it of their own volition. The streets get cleaned up, the birds get rewards, and so what's the harm? Plenty, say two ornithologists from the US and Australia respectively. They feel strongly that the training may change the crow's wild behaviors. In other words, the time spent doing such unnatural jobs for humans will detract and take away time from socializing, foraging, and even vigilance behavior, all to the detriment of the birds. The biggest concern, though, of theirs is the negative health impact of crows sticking cigarette butts containing nicotine and other dangerous chemicals in their beaks, and possibly even to line their nests and contaminate their nestlings. Here's my take on it. I seriously doubt that the crows will ingest enough nicotine by carrying butts in their beaks. And the idea is that they get a reward by depositing them in a machine, not to swallow them. Moreover, if the crows are getting peanuts as a reward, that constitutes a fairly healthy dietary item for a bird. As for impinging on the bird's time to engage in other natural behaviors, I would say that finding food is a prime concern for any city crow, and I sincerely doubt that the behavior will override the strong hormonal drive to undergo reproduction, for instance. But I can think of another way of solving this issue. Make the litterers pay a hefty fine for their actions in the first place. I guarantee the problem will disappear sooner or later, especially if the media reports the fines to the general public. Just look at Singapore as an example. That environment is fairly free of litter, especially chewing gum, 
and they don't use local crows to pick it up. You wouldn't believe what happened to me the other day. I was uh, driving to Paul's farm, you know, the inventor of our squirrel buster bird feeders, and right in his driveway, there was a family of killdeer. Did they know that this week's bird alphabet is K for killdeer? So these birds are considered shorebirds, but I've seen them more often far away from shores. Paul lives on the farm and he has a small pond, but we've actually had killdeer in our backyard briefly though. Uh, killdeer love uh, wetlands, uh, golf courses, and all sorts of pastures, and our property borders a patch of wetland. Killdeer have also been called noisy or chattering plovers, and listen to this, they are so noisy, but they are very tolerant of humans. I was standing just a few meters away from them and filming them, and that's one of the reasons why their population is still doing quite all right. Killdeer can be spotted throughout most of the USA all year round, and then some of them move to northern states and Canada for their breeding season. As you can see at the beginning of June here in Quebec, they already have two chicks. This particular pair might have another brood, but it's not guaranteed at our latitude. In southern areas, they can have up to three broods and they can nest all the way to November. They build their nests on the ground and four eggs are normally laid. I only saw two chicks, so I hope nothing bad happened to the other two eggs. Unlike songbirds, killdeer do not feed their young, but rather bring them to the food source. The chicks stick around until they learn to fly around 20 to 31 days old. As I was filming those killdeer, I witnessed two of the tactics they used to keep predators away from their nest or their chicks. So the first one was false brooding. They basically dropped themselves to the ground pretending to be sitting on a nest. And the other one was injury feigning display because as you know, predators go for an easier prey. So I watched both parents for quite some time and I couldn't tell them apart. That's because kill deer, the two sexes look identical. But I find that of all the plovers, kill deer are the easiest plovers to identify because of the three rings that they have on their head and their neck. And finally, their diets. It's invertebrates and crustaceans. Being a parent is no easy feat, and I think being an avian parent is even harder. So let's check out the top five of our hardworking parents photo contest. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. July is Reflections. All right, everyone, time to say goodbye. I hope you will go out and use Merlin's sound ID. I honestly never thought I would spot a Tennessee and a Nashville warbler in our neighborhood. Goodbye, everyone.